Can't hear you. If you haven't already done so, please silence phones, pagers, anything that might make noise, because we are going to be filming this. I also want to let you know about upcoming chats. On the 16th, which is next Tuesday, we have author Monica Wood. On the 23rd, we have author Adam Koshel. And on the 25th, we will be featuring Steve Raymond, who writes the Spotlight on Seniors uh, um, column. But today, I know we're all very excited about today's speaker, Tess Garrickson. Tess began writing fiction while on maternity leave from her work as a physician. Beginning with the publication of her first novel in 1987, she's published a new book almost every year and is a perennial presence on best-selling lists. Her books have been published in 40 countries and more than 30 million copies have been sold around the world. Her series of novels featuring homicide detective Jane Grizzly and medical examiner Maura Isles inspired the TNT television series Grizzly and Isles, starring Angie Harmon and Sasha Alexander. In addition to writing her latest novel, Playing with Fire, Tess also composed the music that is the centerpiece of the book. But I'll let Tess tell you all about that. Please welcome Tess Erickson. to be a scorcher today. Uh, yeah, it's nice to be in on a, a nice uh, air-conditioned room. Um, thank you for coming out for me. You know, I never know when I go to a, a speaker's event how many people are going to show up, and it's nice to see almost a full house. Um, I thought I would talk, before I get talking about playing with fire, just a little background about where ideas come from for authors and where my ideas come from, because it sort of plays into where Playing With Fire came from. Um, I'm often asked, where did the idea for that book come from? And I would say that most of it has to come from curiosity on the part of being a writer. And I, when people ask, what do you do to become a writer? I tell them, live a life. Read a lot and live a life, because all those stories will come out of your own experiences. Um, but I also love to read the newspaper. I'm very much aware of what's going on in the news. And the example I always use is, is uh, my book, Vanish. I got that from a little article in the Boston Globe. Uh, a couple years um, ago, I, I was reading about a young woman who was found dead in her bathtub in her apartment in the suburbs of Boston. The police uh, saw empty pill bottles, and they decided it was an accidental overdose. So they zipped her into a body bag, and they sent her to the morgue, and a couple of hours later, she woke up. Um, I saw that and I thought, oh, and then my first reaction when I come across something that has that emotional punch is I want to know how often that happens. I want to know more about the incident. I'm not thinking at that point about writing a book. I want to know more about the incident. Because I think we all have the same reaction to, oh my God, wake up in a body bag. <laughs> so um, I did a Google search for uh, mistaken for dead and found a lot of cases of it. It's really kind of disturbing how often it happens. Um, there was a child, that, and this is just in that year, uh, there was a child whose death certificate had just been signed when somebody noticed he was breathing. There was a young man hit by a car in Atlanta, spent the night in the morgue refrigerator. Somebody heard him moving. Uh, my literary agent, who grew up on Nantucket, said, oh, when she was growing up, that used to happen all the time. <laughs> um, and the reason for it was they had, a, they had a nursing home, and the medical director, the doctor who was in charge of declaring people dead, was deaf. So they, would, they would call him up and say, Mrs. Mrs. Smith looks like she's passed away. And he'd come and he'd put a stethoscope on the chest. <laughs> declare her dead and send her off to the morgue. And, and a couple of people woke up in the morgue that year. So, Nan Trekkett used to call this morgue the house of rejuvenation. <laughs> uh, the most disturbing story I came up with was a, a man who was on the autopsy table in New York City. This was in the 70s. Um, pathologist was about to cut him open when the man woke up. And it was the pathologist who had a heart attack and died. <laughs> and at that, and 
now let's you think that that's the worst thing. No, this has actually happened in Brazil, and I and I know this because I saw I saw the picture in the National Enquirer. <laughs> this man was actually cut open on the autopsy table. The doctor saw his heart was beating, and he sent them right back to the hospital where he survived to to have a, a, a picture in the National Enquirer with the shirt open and his autopsy scar showing. So, um, you know, when, when you're a writer, you come across these funny little incidents, and, and you think, there's a book in here. Now, depending on the kind of writer you are, you would take that story in multiple directions. I mean, if you were, if you're a horror writer, you would say, this is a zombie that woke up. Or if you were, um, or you would say, this is a vampire. Now, if you write Jason, the Jason Bourne series, you would say, ah, Jason has just faked his death. This is how he's going to escape. Um, but, you know, I write, I write crime novels. So um, the way I, I did it was I had, um, my medical examiner late one night is, um, you know, she's working and she hears a noise and she opens up a body bag and a woman's eyes pop open. And so Morris calls 911, sends her off to the ER, and um, there the dead woman who's awoken um, does something that nobody expects. She grabs the security guard's gun, she kills him, and she takes hostages in the hospital. So that story that opens up with a woman in the morgue ends up in the, as a hostage crisis in the hospital. But the way I pull my characters into it is that one of the hostages she takes is a very pregnant homicide detective who is, waters are broken, she's there to have her baby, she's in her hospital gown, nobody knows she's a cop, and she's terrified they will find out that she's a cop and she'll be the next to get killed. So that's, you know, that's what happens. You get an idea and you just don't know where it's going to go. Uh, and that book was Vanish. So, um, and sometimes you, you get ideas. I said, you know, writers tend to be curious people. You get ideas based on long-term interests, things that have, have always gripped your, 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 um, your curiosity. Now, I was, a, I was an anthropology major when I was in college. I had this really intense interest in Egyptology, and in particular, because I'm a medical doctor, the biology of mummies. How do you make a mummy? That just was so interesting to me. So over the years, I had been corresponding with a man, an Egyptologist who has an organization called the Mummy Consortium. And this, this organization, um, it's responsible for making sure that, see, that Egyptian mummies in the United States, we have about 500 of them, we want to find out how, you know, look at, we have one to take a better look at them. So he arranges CAT scans of these mummies. Now, they are scanned on the same CAT scans that you and I are scanned on in hospitals. So one day he called me and he goes, we're about to do a CAT scan on a mummy, you want to come and watch? So I, I drove down to Poughkeepsie and helped them move the mummy from the local museum. We put it in a white van, we drove it over to the local hospital, put it on a gurney, <laughs> wheeled it into the hospital um, for its CAT scan. And, and um, as a writer, you're always sort of sucking up information or, or conversations because you might use them in a, in a story. So as I'm standing there watching them arrange for this CAT scan of the mummy, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of dialogue that I think made it into the book. And the dialogue has to do with why it took so long to arrange this CAT scan. Um, the, the doctors wanted to do it. The museum wanted to do it. The reason the CAT scan was not took months was the hospital lawyer. The hospital lawyer said, we cannot allow this because we have rules about patient confidentiality. <laughs> <laughs> and this patient cannot sign a consent form. <laughs> so the way they fixed it was that the museum signed themselves off as the parents. <laughs> um, so then, you know, you, you start the cat scan, and this is something else that I, I found, because I'm a doctor, okay, and I didn't know this. But um, before you can start the program, and it's, it's all a computer program, you have to put in patient information. And I mean, so the first question is, how old is the patient? And the museum said 2,000 years. So they put in 2,000 years, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't start. The program would not start. So they changed it to a day old. And then it wanted to know the gender. Now, I didn't know this. And I, like I said, I'm a doctor. But these CAT scan programs allow for three choices for gender, male, female, and other. 
And so that this CAT scan technologist said, please, can we put other, I've never done that before. So, so this patient went into the CAT scan as a one day old other. And if you've ever had a CAT scan, I know a lot of us have, it's pretty much just like a cross section of x-rays um, that, that the computer takes multiple views and you get to see the body in 3D. Uh, so we're watching the CAT scan and it's very quick. You see the brain is missing, um, as the brain should be missing in an Egyptian mummy. And if you ever wondered how they get that brain out, you know there's only one hole that's punched to the nostril. They used to think that they put a, a hook up there and hook the brain and pull it out. But um, that, an Egyptologist has tried doing that on a, on a cadaver and he said you cannot do it because the brain is too soft. It's like, it's like trying to hook on a tofu. So what they determined, and this is the way he got the brain out through that one little hole, was he blended the brain in place with sort of an inserted whisk. And the brain, and then the brain, the head is just tilted down. And that's how they got the brain out. And that's, we're assuming that's how the Egyptians did it, which is quite ingenious. Uh, so we're watching the rest of the CAT scan. The organs are all missing, as they should be. And we got down to the thigh bone, and there was a break, a fracture of the femur. And it had not healed. So that was the, you know, supposed means of, of why this young man died, is that maybe he fell off a horse, bled into his thigh bone, and died. Um, but you know, as, as a writer, you're always watching things and thinking, what would be weird? What would be strange? What would, if you were standing in this thing and watching a CAT scan, what would be unexpected? And what would be unexpected is, in a 2,000-year-old mummy, to find, buried deep in the muscle, a bullet. Oh. So that, was, that ended up being the premise for my book, The Keepsake, which is Mortal Isles is watching a cat scan of an ancient Egyptian mummy that's just been found in a museum, and she sees a bullet, and she picks up the phone and calls Jane Rizzoli, because now it's a homicide investigation. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, um, a couple of things about this. First of all, that fractured femur is not, probably did not kill him. Um, many, many Egyptian mummies have fractured femurs, or other fractured bones, and the reason for this is that it takes 80 days to make a mummy, to turn a body into essentially what is um, dry caught fish. Uh, <laughs> so it takes 80 days to do that, um, and in the meantime they are building a made-to-order coffin. And as back then, as is today, sometimes craftsmanship is a little shoddy, somebody did measure the body right, and when it's time to put them into the coffin, it doesn't fit. And so they break bones. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that I thought that my idea was really, really creative. You know, the idea of, 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 of trying to disguise a modern-day homicide victim as a mummy. It turns out it has actually been done in real life. Um, my Egyptologist friend was called to India to do a consult on a mummy that the museum wanted to buy, but they were not quite sure this was, this, there's something wrong with this mummy. He gets there, he looks at the CAT scan, and he says, oh, this is something weird about this mummy. First of all, it was a bad mummification job, but the one thing that tipped him off that this was very unusual was that it was a young woman and her teeth had been pulled. Oh. And he said, you did not do that in ancient Egypt because you needed your teeth in the afterlife. So he said, I think you have a homicide victim here. I think this they pulled the teeth to hide the fact she had modern dental work. Oh. And went to investigation and they ended up arresting members of her family. They had killed her because she had dishonored them, and then they thought, let's make money. So they mummified her and tried to sell her to the museum. So here I have such a creative idea, right? <laughs> some criminal somewhere beat me to it. Um, so that, you know, those are examples of how curiosity, reading the newspapers, paying attention to what's happening in, in, around you, and always cultivating your interests lead to so many interesting ideas or stories. Sometimes, though, stories come to you in ways you don't expect, and that's, now we're getting to the book Playing With Fire, which came to me in a way that has never happened to me before. I was in Venice for my birthday, and um, probably had a few too many glasses of wine, because that night, I had a nightmare. I dreamt that I was playing my violin. I'm, I'm very much an amateur violinist, but I was playing the violin, and um, I remember that it was some kind of a disturbing, dark melody, and there was a baby sitting next to me. And the baby's eyes glowed red, and she turned into a monster, because I was playing this music. So I woke up with this, with this nightmare, thinking, wow, what does this mean? I mean, I understand now, actually, where it came from, because my first grandchild was about to be born. 
And I think this was anxiety about what she would turn into. <laughs> So I walked around and I think, okay, this is a story. There's a story here, something about the power of music to transform um, a personality, to maybe to convey evil, maybe to, to, to you know, start. It's, anyway, music has a bad ending in this story. But I didn't know where the rest of the story was. And I don't like paranormal. It has to have something that's logical and scientific and be explainable. And I wasn't sure where music came in. So, that day we walked in Venice and I ended up at the old, in the old Jewish quarter. Um, and if you've ever been to this area, um, they, have, they have a lot of memorials to the 246 Jews from Venice who were deported during World War II. Almost all of them died in Poland. And there was one wooden plaque with a number of names on it. And these were the names of those Jews. It was just a name and an, and an age. And I noticed this cluster of names by the last name Todesco. And it was like, there's your story. There's, there's the other half of my story. I'm going to write about the Todescos. So, Playing With Fire is about a very, very talented young violinist um, in around 1940s. He's Jewish. His name is Lorenzo Todesco. And he lives in Venice. He's also a composer. And he falls in love with this, this beautiful young cellist. And, he, and you see how he comes to compose this mysterious piece of music called Incendio, which in Italian means <coughs> fire. Um, you find out where the, how he composes the music, why he composes the music, and you also find out what happens to Lorenzo. Now, 70 years later, it is now modern day. Uh, a, a woman violinist named Julia is in Rome. She finds a, co a handwritten copy of Incendio, the sheet music, in an antique store. She brings it home, and every time she plays it, her three-year-old daughter goes crazy and does something really violent. So she's, you know, she thinks, is, is this music evil? Is this music awakening something in my daughter? Do I, you know, I'm worried about, she's worried about whether her daughter is a monster, and that's the monster of my dreams. Um, but she's also concerned about her own sanity, because her mother died in the insane asylum. And the problem is, nobody is there to watch this daughter do these horrible things, only Julia. So nobody believes her. Um, to save her sanity and to really get to the bottom of this, she has to go back to Italy, and there she uncovers the story of Lorenzo Tedesco. So these, these two stories told, they're 70 years apart, are told in inner, inner um, weaving chapters. Um, now, part of the story, and a great deal of the story, has to do with um, the, the Holocaust in Italy. And I had before I could write that story, I had a little bit of a hesitation because I'm, I'm not Jewish. I'm, uh, I'm Chinese American and I felt as if I might not really have the right to tell this story. I mean, it's not my story. It's not my family. It's not my, my legacy. So what right did I have to tell a, a, such a painful story um, about um, a, you know, a different group of people? And the way I approached it was to tell it as part of the same tribe that both Lorenzo and Julia belong to. You know, I may not be Jewish, I may not be a professional violinist like Julia, but I am a musician. And there's something wonderful about what I call the tribe of musicians. It's an international tribe. It knows no geographical boundaries. It knows no language boundaries. You put a sheet of music in front of a violinist from China, a violinist from Italy, and a violinist from America. They can't talk to each other but they can communicate to that, that music. They all know what that music means, they all understand that music, even if that music was written 300 years ago. So that is a universal language, it truly is. I mean, music plays directly to our emotions. So I wrote it um, basically from the point of view of what it's like to be a musician. And the other thing I share with Lorenzo and Julia is the sense of what it's like to play the violin. Now, the violin is just a, it's just a wooden box, okay? But you, you put it, you put your bow across it, and you, you feel the vibrations of this wood against your skin. Um, violins are very personal, and um, just that, just owning a violin, people buy their violins, and very often this is, this is a longer relationship than they'll have with their spouse. <laughs> the musician other instrument is a very, very intimate one. Um, I, I own two violins. One of them was made in 1776 in Dublin, which is not known as a violin making center, but when I play it, I feel like every single jig and reel that was ever played on that fiddle is still somewhere in that wood, because violins are very much alive. I mean, the wood is alive, and um, you'll hear musicians say, if you don't play your violin often enough, 
it goes to sleep. That's the, that is the term they use for somehow the sound changing. Violins need to have um, you know, stimulation. The wood needs to be stimulated, otherwise the sound starts to close down. My other violin was made in Cremona. I went to Italy, Cremo, um, Cremona, which is the city of violins. It's where Stradivari and Guarneri worked. Um, and the great thing about Cremona is that all the violin makers are still there. And they send their instruments to this like central store where you, you can go in and play them all in succession. They'll leave you alone for hours just to play the violins and you, until you find the one that's meant for you. And I'm asked, well, how do you know it's meant for you? And it's a little bit like Harry Potter's wand. And how the wand chooses the wizard. Well, there's something very mysterious going on. Um, I'd say it's sort of like being in a room with crying babies. You can hear your own baby, right? You can always hear your own baby. You know which one is yours. So um, that violin was, is, uh, is my second violin. And um, in the story, Lorenzo plays a 200-year-old violin that was made in Cremona, which he inherited from his, his, uh, his grandfather. So it's about violins, violinists, music, but it's also about really painful time, and that's the Holocaust in Italy. Um, I did a, a lot of research on this because it was unfamiliar to me what happened in Italy. And I think it's unfamiliar to a lot of us. Um, we know what happened in Germany, we know what happened in Austria and Poland, but a lot of people don't really know what happened in Italy, which was an unusual, it was, it was, it was, um, it was a, an example of something that, that is puzzling to a lot of people. 90% of the Jews in Poland died. 80% of the Jews in Italy survived in Italy. Um, so the question is why? Um, now, there's, there's a practical um, matter in that the Holocaust in Italy did not start until 1943. They did not start deporting people until 43. So they, they had, you know, less maybe only, only a year of true um, danger. Um, so that was part of it. Um, another part of it has to do with the Italian character. I mean, there are some people that say, if you drive in Rome today and look at the traffic and look at Roman drivers, you understand why the Holocaust failed so badly in Italy. <laughs> um, part of it is that Italians who don't, who they don't believe in a rule, they won't follow it. Um, but the other thing that made it <clears throat> unusual is how completely integrated Jews were in Italian society. 40, over 40% 40 of Jewish marriages pre-World War II were to non-Jews. They uh, occupied every, um, every occupation level from doctors and bankers all the way down to laborers. So there's a good chance that your, your brother-in-law would be Jewish, uh, that your employees would be Jewish, that your colleagues would be Jewish. So they were, you know, they were your friends, they were your parts of your family. So um, that, that probably helped a lot of them. Um, and there's also the question about whether Mussolini was actually anti-Semitic. Um, his, his mistress was a Jew. She lived up. She lived to the war, and she, she wrote his biography. Um, the other thing, that, you know, Mussolini's statements seem to imply that he, he actually was not all that anti-Semitic um, compared to other, you know, to other um, Anglo men um, of his of his era. Unfortunately, he was surrounded by anti-Semites, and he was also, you know, an ally to Hitler. So eventually, he had to start showing that he was with the program, and it started off. Um, it started off in a way that probably did not worry too many Jews at first. It started off with editorials in newspapers. Um, and even today, if you want to see where you think the country is going, look at the media. Look at the media's reporting. Look at the editorials are saying. Now, the first, they, they fired all the Jewish journalists very quickly. So newspapers did not have the Jewish voice um, to counteract what was coming. Um, there was also editorial decisions that were made so that if a Jew did something horrible, it would be on the front page. If a Jew did something wonderful, it would not be reported. So just controlling what goes on the front page would affect public opinion. And this was happening fairly early. Uh, but then eventually the laws began. And the first law was that if you were a Jewish, if you were a student or you were a professor or you were a teacher um, and you were Jewish, you could no longer go to school. So all these students no longer could go to school. I mean, university students suddenly couldn't get their degrees. Um, all these professors were fired. Um, what, did they, what did the Italian Jews think about this? Now, they were feeling pretty safe. Most of them thought, whatever is happening over there in Germany will never happen in Italy. This is Italy. We're Italians. Everybody knows we're loyal Italians. The Jews had been in Italy for 2,000 years. Um, so when this happened, this was pretty devastating. Um, 
a lot of people decided maybe it was time to leave. Maybe they could look into the future and see what was coming and they would emigrate. But most of the people who emigrated were young because they did not have, you know, they didn't have that the careers or their homes or their businesses established yet. The older ones probably thought, let's ride it out. This is the worst it's going to get, right? It will get no worse. Well, of course, it did get worse. Next, you could not marry a non-Jew, which threw into question, you know, what about the mixed marriages that are already here? And then the editorials got worse. It started talking about how Italian, how Jews were not loyal Italians, how um, their children were much more likely to pass around tuberculosis. Um, and then they passed laws that said, you know, you couldn't become a banker, you couldn't be a doctor, lawyers lost their jobs, architects lost their jobs, you couldn't play music on the radio if it was composed by a Jew, you couldn't teach from a textbook that was written by a Jew. It just got worse and worse. So, Around Italy, I'm sure that every little Jewish family was having the same conversation that Lorenzo's family has in the book. Do we stay or do we go? And that would have been a really tough question because you're pulling up roots. You have your home, you have your elderly parents. You can't leave them behind. Um, and if you do go, where do you go? Which countries are going to be taking you? So a lot of people just thought, they kept thinking, it's the worst it can get. This is the worst it can get. Well. Uh, it kept getting worse, and in 1943, it was December, uh, well actually it started off in late summer in 1943, they began to do the deportations. They would, um, they would collect people, um, they would put them on trains and send them, most of them went to Poland and were never seen again. Um, it, did, it did not happen in Venice until December. Yeah, Venice was like one of the last cities to be, um, to how, where Jews were rounded up. Probably for one particular reason and one particular hero. It was a man named Dr. Giuseppe Jonah. He was a Jewish doctor. He lost his job, so he was unemployed. But he had a very responsible position in the Jewish community in Venice, which was he had all the records. He knew, he had all the, all the, family, um, all the family statistics. He knew where all the Jews were in Venice. He knew where they lived. He knew their names. He, um, and he was the guardian of these records. So one day, an SS officer came to his office and said, Dr. Jonah, we need, we need those records. And Dr. Jonah, who had been paying attention to what was happening in Europe, said, I'll give them to you tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. So that night, he gathered them all up, every scrap of paper. He burned them all, and he committed suicide. So the next day, SS has no information, and he has no way of getting this information. It probably delayed the roundup of the Jews in Venice for about a month, which gave people, if they were canny, time to get out. Um, nevertheless, in December, it started, it, had, it was one night it happened, they, they were playing air raid sirens. They were, um, and air raid sirens were happening all the time in Venice, but Venice was never bombed, uh, because the Allies thought it was too beautiful a city to bomb. Um, so when, when the, the local Venice, uh, Venetians heard the, bomb, the sirens, they were not particularly worried. The reason the sirens were played that night was to hide the sound of the arrests that were happening throughout the city. Um, over a hundred Jews were rounded up that night. They were crowded into a school and just the doors were shut and left there for almost two weeks with no food. Elderly people, families and children, no food. Um, how did they survive? Well, this is a, this is a clue about what's going to happen in Italy. Look, the neighbors and friends grabbed food and threw it to the window. So that was an example of how the Italians weren't necessarily going to let this happen. But eventually they were rounded up and they were brought to the train and they were put on a third class passenger train. It was a regular passenger train and they were allowed to write letters to their friends while they were on this train. And the letters went often like, we're on a train, we're going to work camp, we'll write you when we get there, everything is fine. And that's the last they're heard of. So it tells you the people who were on this train had no idea what was going to happen. They really didn't. I mean, if they had known, they wouldn't have gotten on that train. And there's a story of one train that broke down. Uh, people were allowed to get off the train, and then they got back on the train to continue the journey to Poland, including one young man who was, he was left behind, and he ran to catch up with the train. Um, so they had no idea. Um, you know, I was just, I was in Poland uh, two months ago, and we visited Auschwitz. And one thing that struck me was they had, um, they had various rooms with displayed what people brought to the death camp. A lot of them brought cooking utensils. It just tells you 
They thought they were just going to be relocated. They thought they were going to be cooking. I mean, there's a room full of pots and pans. Um, so they had no idea. Um, anyway, that's the bad side of the story. That's the sad part, that some people died. I mean, you, even though 80% survived, 20% were exterminated. Um, the good part of the story that I wanted to focus on and that I really thought was the most important part of the story was who did the right thing? You know, what were the acts of heroism? And there were some interesting and somewhat sometimes, you know, amusing things about what happened. There was a, there was a, a mailman, an Italian mailman. He knew who the local informer was who was sending mail to the SS commander. And whenever he got a mail, a, a letter, um, from, the, from the informer that was bound for the SS guy, that letter never got there. <laughs> Just disappeared. Who knew what happened? Um, there were police officers who were ordered to round up their Jews, and the night before, they would go door to door and tell these families, I'm coming to arrest you in the morning. And of course, overnight, they would disappear. Um, there were priests and nuns who, would, who hid a lot of Jews. Monasteries and, and convents ended up, and churches ended up being kind of like this underground railway where they would try to get people over the border, but, but people would shelter in convents and monasteries. So um, a lot of priests and nuns uh, were, were heroes, and 200 were executed by the SS because of it. There were numerous numbers of just everyday Italians who were, who were executed by the Nazis for trying to protect their friends and neighbors. Um, and then there are numbers of stories of, of um, police officers who would help find fake papers, and they knew when the SS was coming to town, and they'd go around and warn people. There was one Jew who uh, um, sheltered the entire war in an apartment in Rome. His landlord knew he was a Jew. His banker knew he was a Jew. His banker would actually cash his pension checks and give him the money. Every day he'd walk to the streets and see all his friends and neighbors. They all knew who he was. Nobody turned to him. Uh, but then, of course, there are always the collaborators, and this, so it's, it's a story of the heroes and villains. And um, I think that, that that was probably the most wonderful part about the research, was how many brave people there were. And I think the book also raises the question, um, what would you do? I mean, if, you, if your neighbor came to you for help, would you risk it? It's always this interesting thought experiment of would you risk your life, and maybe even your family's life, to do the right thing? So. Um, halfway through the story, um, of writing the story, an, inter an interesting thing happened to me. I had been writing about this music in Chendio. The music didn't exist, okay? It was just a fictional piece of music. And I, but I described it in really great detail. I said it was, it's the waltz, the beautiful waltz, that starts to get more and more disturbing and more and more hard to hear. And there are things called devil's chords that take place, you know, like towards the end of the story. And if, you don't, if you're not a musician, you don't know what a devil's chord is, but it's, it's actually a term that comes from mid medieval music. It's two notes that are somewhat jarring to the ear, and it was forbidden to play those in the church, so because they thought they were evil. So, of course, I had to put them in my fiction piece. <laughs> um, and then I, then I mentioned that it ends up with this funereal set of chords. Well, having described it so completely, I think I, I sort of got to work on my brain, and one morning I woke up and I heard that I had the melody in my head. Um, so because I play the piano, I was able to play that music almost immediately and recorded it on my cell phone so I wouldn't lose it. And it took me six weeks to actually record, to actually compose the entire piece of Chandio for piano and violin. And then I didn't know what to do with it. I thought, well, it sounds nice to me, but what does anybody else think? I sent it to a, an acquaintance in London who he, he um, produces classical recordings. And I said, what do you think I should do with this? And he said, I know just the violinist to record this piece of music. Um, and he chose a woman named uh, Suzanne Howe, who is an internationally known concert violinist who's played with 50 orchestras around the world. And um, the first time Suzanne and I spoke was on the phone. And she said, um, I'm now practicing your piece of music in Chendio in Paris. My windows are open, and there's a crowd listening on the street below. <laughs> so she recorded the music um, and, and did a wonderful job. And um, there's one more thing I want to tell you about before I actually am going to play. I'm going to give you a little slideshow with the music, if technically everything works. Um, so Suzanne, um, she has a violin. She, she, she plays with a violin. She calls it Charlie, and let me tell you a little bit about her violin. 
Now, I told you, right, that um, uh, Lorenzo plays a violin that was 200 years old, made in Cremona. It just so happened that Suzanne tours with a violin made in Cremona 200 years ago. Or it would have been 200 years at the time Lorenzo was alive. So it's this weird, coin another one of these strange coincidences. And I'll end with, um, I told you about how violins and violinists have this very strong bond. How did she get this amazing 200-year-old violin made by Guarneri? Um, well, Charlie, we'll just call it Charlie, because that's his name now, has a really, really distinguished history. It's been played by amazing violinists over the centuries. But poor Charlie um, had the misfortune of ending up in a glass case in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's so valuable. Um, and there it was played once a year. Remember what I said about violins going to sleep? Well, I, well, it was there for 12 years in this glass case, and that's not where violins should be. So one day, um, Suzanne was, was given permission to play all the instruments at the Metropolitan Museum. And she got to Charlie, and she played it. She goes, she says, the first time, it sounded as if she was hearing the sound through layers of dust. But she said there was something still there. And she said to the curator, can I keep on playing this, this instrument for a while? And he said, sure. Four hours later, she's still playing the violin. The curators are all there watching. The, the museum is closed. Um, and they said to her, very astonished, you woke it up. You woke up this violin. So they called the owner of the violin, who's a very wealthy man in, in the Midwest, who you know, the violin is on loan to the Metropolitan, and said, Suzanne Howe just woke up your violin. We think, we think this, this instrument really needs to be played. And so it's on long-term loan, Suzanne. Um, she, she's, been, she's been touring with this violin that she does not own, still belongs to this man, for a couple of years. And she's very careful with it because Charlie is worth $10 million. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you travel with a $10 million violin? You know, um, very carefully. Uh, she's responsible. Suzanne and Charlie are responsible for the new policy at Air Canada, which is if you are a professional musician traveling with your, it's your violin, you board with the children. So you always have overhead space. Um, there is no, there's no stewardess who, there's no flight attendant who wants to have to, um, you know, pay up a ten million dollar insurance policy for an instrument that's been damaged. Um, so that, that's the, that's the, the odd little thing. I mean, it started off with a dream, in it, middle way it came up with another dream, and then I ended up with this beautiful violin player and this beautiful recording on a piece, on an instrument that was made on a, um, you know, that was recorded with an instrument very, very close to what my fictional character. Um, ended up recording it on, uh, or playing it on. So we're going to try, hold on, see if I can wake it up. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I love when it works. Okay, I know, I just want it to work. Okay, where's my... All right, if, lower the lights. And you're going to be listening to, to that violin playing. Hopefully everything works. My scribbles.
husband is sitting over there. He, he and my son, all those images you saw were taken by him and my son on that trip to Venice. And the one question I always ask and ask is, how do you get pictures of Venice with no people in them? They got up at four in the morning. <laughs> Um, the other thing is that the last, the last couple of uh, shots were from the ghetto, the Jewish ghetto. And the last shot was the wooden plaque, and I mean, you probably can't see it, but the Tordesco is. Uh, um, so I would, you know what, I'd, I'd love to take some questions. You can ask about anything, either this or about Rizzoli and Isles. And please, ask away. Yes? Um, you know, I'm mostly a, sort of a, an Irish Celtic fiddler, so most of my stuff is like jigs and reels. And so, <laughs> this was really, I mean, this came out of left field, but um, I think that it was easier for me because I do, I do like, I like klezmer music, and I think a lot of the chords and a lot of, um, you know, the key itself, it comes very much out of klezmer tradition. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> about, you know, us being faced with do, doing the right thing, you know, it, it would be hard for us. I, I think it's, I kind of wonder how, how difficult it often is to know what the right thing is. Right. It's not always, uh, maybe even not usually obvious. Yeah, well sometimes, sometimes it's not obvious until it's like too late. Um, yeah. I mean, when you when when it push comes to shove and you know they're about to kill your neighbor, then it's more clear. But if you see that danger coming, you just don't know when to intervene. It, it, it's a it's a really hard question. I thought, you know, part of the reason this, the story I wrote it it's a much briefer book than most of my books, as I wanted. I thought it was really a good book for young adults, um, for young people to think about what what I do in that situation. Also because Lorenzo and Laura are both like. 18 years old. So um, it's it's a thought experiment that you can't really answer until you're you're caught in that situation. Um, one thing that we had when we were at Auschwitz, we had this incredible Italian. Um, I think um, was he Italian? I don't know what kind of a guy he was. No, he was he was Polish, but he looked Italian. Um, and he talked about how ordinary people just did horrible things, and how did they? How did you make an ordinary person an ordinary? Maybe a normal German soldier do such terrible things, and how do you go down that slippery slope? So that was that's something that's always worth thinking about. What what turns a neighbor into a collaborator? You know? Yes. I have read every one of your stories. Mm -hmm. Are you ever going back to the medical mysteries? Oh. <laughs> well, you know that's a good question because I'm um, I'm at the stage now where I feel like I have maybe 20 more good creative years left. And, and this is the time to do all the crazy things that I you know, haven't done up till now. Um, well, as an example, okay, my son and I just finished making a horror film. I think maybe um, it's called Island Zero. It's now in post-production. It's with the composer that's composing the, the um, soundtrack. And it just needs a little CGI, and then we're off to the races with, um, with film festivals. So that was like another thing that came out of left field. It was so much fun. Um, and it's filmed entirely in Maine. Um, and the other thing I've, I've been doing is um, I'm thinking about, okay, and you know, okay, I'm going to let our secret here. I'm thinking about writing a romantic um, ghost story, <laughs> horror novel. <laughs> It's all one like romantic ghost story horror novel. It basically it's a woman who falls in love with a ghost, and it turns out the ghost is not what she wants to be falling in love with. Um, and um, but it would be so out of left field that I thought that I should probably write that under a pseudonym. <laughs> you know, and guess who my pseudonym is? Maura Isles. <laughs> because if you watch the TV show, she wants to be a writer, right? So. You gave me the idea that I'm going to move more to me and actually just going to write a lot of films. <laughs> so, um, but, but back to your question. Um, I have, I'm, I'm in the planning process, or the thinking process, of, of maybe writing another historical novel. Remember um, The Bone Garden? I love writing that. About uh, anesthesia. The history of anesthesia. Because um, just imagine what it was like back then to get surgery without it. So, I, I have no idea what I'm going to write, <laughs> actually. Yes. How, how much input have you had into the scripts for Rizzoli and Isles? None at all. They, uh, they have their own. 
they have their own team of writers. And so, you know, if you if you notice that the TV show is quite different from the books, it started off that way from the very beginning. Although the pilot episode was taken from my book, The Apprentice. Um, but they started off. I mean, it's Hollywood. They have their actresses are way more beautiful than my characters, um, and Mora Isles looks nothing like my Mora Isles. Um, and there's a lot more humor, a lot more glamour. Um, but you know, I can't argue with success. They, they're finishing up. Their, their, you know, it's ending after seven seasons. Yeah. Um, for those of you who wonder why it's ending after seven seasons, because it's it's going out on top. It's the number one rated show on TNT, and it's being canceled. Um, the reason um, there's there's a lot of whispers about it, but um, one of the question, one of the reasons that was given to me was that they have, TNT has a new program director who came on last year, two years ago. And is, was very concerned about the demographics of who watches Rizzoli and Dice, which tends to be females who are a little older. <laughs> That's a bad thing. So um, anyway, the advertisers do not do not like that demographic. They want young male viewers, and so it, that was that was really a big black mark against against keeping Rizzoli and Dice going, even though it's still number one. Um, so they're they're sort of revamping the the uh, the channel that that cable channel. Um, and I think they're looking for edgier television shows, and I guess Rosalie and Isles was like comfort food to a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Okay. I just I finished my twelfth book. It's been turned in. It'll probably come out next year. It's um, it resolves a lot of romantic issues. If you have any questions about what happens to Mora and the priest, you have to read this book. <laughs> or Angela and her ex and her husband. What happens that? Um, it's called Strange Girl, and we think it'll be coming. Uh, uh, the last I heard was 2017, but I really don't know. Um, it's up in the air. Yes. First compliments I've heard you talk about uh, Fire. Um, I forget the exact title, and you did a wonderful job and made it totally different, and that's great. Um, the question I have is, I forget how it, what condition Julia had that made her think her daughter was acting out when actually everything was normal. Well, that's a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. I, how many of you? So read everybody it? has to read it very yeah. quickly yeah. before. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, uh, it's it's. Um, okay. I, you don't have to answer that. You whisper. It doesn't matter. Okay. I don't want to spoil it for other people. Uh, yeah, I know. But first of all, let me tell you, this is not a horror novel. This is not a paranormal novel. Remember, I am a medical doctor, so there must be a logical explanation for it. And and this is you know this has really awakened my eyes to the difference between people who read digitally and people who read print. Um, there are a number of clues sprinkled throughout the first two thirds of the book. In fact, I believe that everything you need to know to understand what's happening is told in the first half of the book. Um, but I think digital readers read so fast. They skip over those clues, and they get to the end. They go, "Well, that came out of left field," um, but actually, it didn't. It was always there. Those clues were always there. And um, I had a reader rewrite me and said, he, "He said, I knew within the first third what was going on because I had that same condition." And he, okay, well, let, you know, let's just let, let's just talk about spoiler. Okay? Because I, I can't, I can't talk about it. All right, okay. <laughs> That's very interesting. I'll just make one final comment. We read it digitally, or we read it audio. Yeah. Oh, okay, maybe that helps. And so, and so we missed it totally until it came to the end. Was it a bridge or unabridged? Unabridged, I think. I think it's unabridged. Okay. We read the unabridged. Oh yeah, I know. See, this is this is the, this is what I I oh, struggle with as a writer. I struggle with as a writer. Um, but re right, readers read so fast, and yet mystery readers are really smart. So you're trying to you're trying to fool them. You're trying to put in the clues in ways that they don't notice it. But if you're too clever at it, then the stupid readers <laughs> don't get the clues, and then they think, "How did that get solved?" Um, so it's you're always you're always kind of balancing, you know, how much information you give and how how. Well disguised it is because there's a, there's a variety of people who pick clues up and some people who don't. I just think that it's easier to pick it up if you're reading print because you go back and forth and, it's, and you take your time a little more. Uh, print readers do do read more deeply. I mean that's it's my experience that when I read an article uh, online from the New York Times and then I read it in the paper, I pick up things that I missed. Yes. 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 
those older women, I, I just wanted to say it was fun to see you on this audience. <laughs> that was, yeah, I played, I played a cameo role. This, it was a really meta kind of thing in that. They called me on to say, you want to do a cameo since that last season? And I said, sure. And um, so what's the script? They had me play myself. And the situation is that Maura and Jane go to a writer's conference, because Maura's interested in becoming a writer. And there, while she's there, they say, oh, you've got to meet Tess. <laughs> so I'm there as myself. <laughs> and so there I am as a, a writer yeah. saying hello to my two creations. <laughs> <as> a, <you laughs> know, yeah. Anyway, it was, it, was, it was really fun. It was, um, one thing I didn't know is, um, I was blown away by how nicely they treated me. Here's, here, okay, here's why TV is so expensive. A couple days before my shoot, they called me up and said, what, you know, this man, this man I never talked to, said, what is your bra size? <laughs> <laughs> so he, he gets my measurements and then he goes, okay, I'm going to go shopping now for your, for your, your costume. So I, I arrive there, I get there, and they send me to the Edith Head. Um, yeah, I was like, cool, right? Edith, 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 Edith Head Center. And there's a rack of clothes that he's just bought from Saks Fifth Avenue. About 10 dresses. He says, which one do you like? So I tried them on. Of course, the tags are still on there because whatever I don't choose goes back to sex. Yeah. And so I see how much he spent. It was like $600, $700 dresses. Oh, Plus, they, they're letting me wear like $700 mono of Blanix for the, for the show. So I picked a lovely orangey dress and they, they brought the they had me take it in. So the tailor comes in and, and, she, and she gets it all rearranged. So that dress cannot be returned to sex. I shoot my scene and I say, well, what happens to this beautiful dress? They go, they say, well, it goes to the Warner Brothers Costume Museum. Worn once, seven hundred dollar dress. Um, I said, well, what if I took it? <laughs> I said, oh, you're not supposed to do that. You know, you're not supposed to do that. So I mentioned that to. Uh, I won't say which of the stars I mentioned this to, but she said, oh, you should have just taken it. She said, we do that all the time. <laughs> she also added. What are they going to do about it? You know? <laughs> they can't fire us. So um, anyway, that was, and they gave me a, my own trailer for the day. I mean, it was a huge trailer. You could live in it with a kitchen and a, and a bathroom just, just for this, you know, for like, what, three minutes? Three minutes on camera? Why don't you think it was two minutes? Maybe one minute on camera. <laughs> Do you have the beginning of the end, or no. do you let your characters surprise you? I'm often surprised. <laughs> I'm often shocked. Um, usually, the, uh, it's this, this idea comes to me, and oh, let's go back to let's go back to the woman in the body bag. Okay, got that idea. And I thought, well, I, I know where the, I know where the opening is. I know that Mara's the one who finds the body bag, the woman in the body bag, and I know this person takes hostages in the hospital because I'd already set up that Ma that Jane is about to give birth. So that all came together. But um, when I started writing that book, and I just started writing, I had no, no idea, number one, who this person in the body bag was, why this person took hostages, and what was going to happen. And I got, I should also tell you that my first draft, the person in the body bag was a man. So, so, so he kills a guard, he takes hostages, Jane's stuck in the x-ray room, uh, in the x-ray department with a bunch of other people who are terrified. Um, and I'm a third away from the book, and I still don't know why he's doing these things. And um, this is where this happens to me with every book. I got writer's block because I don't know what happens next. And that's why my process is really bad. I don't recommend my process. Yeah, I've done it for 27 books, but I don't recommend it. Um, so then, um, I, there I am. And, I, and the worst part about writer's block is that this happens when you get bored with your story. You're bored. You know, I, think, I don't know what goes on. I don't care. So I ended up having to go on a, on a trip to Texas, and I was driving through Texas. It was a three-hour, four-hour drive. Texas is a big state. Um, and there, in the middle of driving, the reason I was bored came to me. Um, and the reason I was bored was because it was a man who was doing all these things. And you know, think about it. Who takes hostages in this world? It's men. And when they do, it's always usually kind of boring reasons. So I was bored. And I thought, but I had this revelation there. I thought, oh, what if it was a woman? A woman who takes hostages is suddenly really interesting because 
they don't, we don't do that kind of stuff. We don't do crazy stuff like that. <laughs> so I thought, that's, and then all of a sudden I, I was ready to do the rest of the book. I went home, and here's the other part of my process. I did not stop to fix anything. I just kept on writing from that point on as if it had always been a woman in the body bag. So if you were to read the first draft, you'd be really confused. I don't, you know, it starts off as a man, and all of a sudden from one page to the next, I'm referring to him as her. Um, but that's, I find that that's an important thing that I tell people who are trying to write a book. Don't stop to fix things, because you will never get, you will never get past the first half of the book. Just finish the first draft, and then fix stuff later on. Um, I know. I know aspiring writers who have like, you know, a dozen half-finished books in their drawers because they get that point, they don't know what happens next, and then they, they're like, you know, they're like squirrels. Oh, I have a better idea. And they go off and find and start another book. So that, that's, you know, my, that's part of it is that finish the first draft. And the other thing is, um, I find that if I try creating on a laptop, on my computer, I end up editing again and again and again, and I never get past the first page. So I write my first drafts with pen and paper. Um, I can type. I mean, I can type 120 words a minute. I can clock at 120 words. So that's not my problem. It's that I see it on the screen. And I think, oh, I could fix that sentence. Oh, I could fix it again. Oh, that paragraph. You know, so you never get over it. But because I'm a doctor, my handwriting is really bad. So I don't see the flaws as I'm handwriting. It. And the other thing I do is I write. You know. I write with a pen and I write with unlined typing paper because I think the lines bother me. <laughs> so, you know, it's really all that works for you. Um, there's, there's process and whatever, you, whatever process you get, you get comfortable with, just, just keep on using it. I mean, I, 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 I keep saying I'm an old dog, you can't teach me new tricks, but the trick still works. Yeah. Continuing with the writing process, it just shows a wonderful film, Genius, here. Mm -hmm. um, the role of Max Perkins as editor for um, Thomas Wolf. What about roles of editors? Oh, do you do, you do all your own revisions? Do other people give yeah. suggestions? I do not show my book to my editor until I feel it's just about ready for print. Um, because I want her to get fresh eyes on what I think is a is a complete story. Um, and I but I have had the great the good fortune of always having worked with brilliant editors. I mean, I've been with, I can't even tell you how many editors I've worked with over my career. Every single one has been a female, and every single one has been excellent. Um, and, but in the end, I'm still the boss, so that, you know, maybe they'll suggest something, and I'll take 90% of their suggestions. Of uh, the 10%, I'll say, no, I'm holding firm on this. Um, and uh, you just have to trust your editor. Um, one of my editors, my English editor, said that I was unusual, and that she, she says, I'm, I'm the one that pretty much ends up giving her finished copy. She goes, she doesn't have to do much for it. She only has, usually my editorial revision letter is only a couple pages long. Um, so there's not a lot to do, and usually I can finish everything in two weeks. Um, but I think it's really important that it, it be as polished as possible, because if they have to edit it again and again and again, it gets old for them, it gets, they get sick of the story too, I want them to look at it with the excitement of saying, hey, this is already pretty good. Um, one thing I have to say, um, oh, I know I'm on tape, but I'm very sad about the fact my, my long-term editor at Valentine was recently dismissed. Um, and I think this might be happening in publishing a lot. I hear about this a lot. She's a, she, the senior editors, the ones who've been there for many years and have acquired a certain pay scale, are being let go. Um, and I think it's a corporate decision more than anything else, but it's just, it's... It's really heartbreaking because you trust these people, and then I mean, my new editor is, is, is wonderful. She's perfectly fine, but I hate seeing people who've given so much loyalty to a company get cut off like that just because you know they're making too much money. Yes. Uh, who's your favorite authors? My favorite authors. You know, I when I'm on holiday, I read nonfiction. I, you know, I just I just love nonfiction. Um, my favorite author of all time. Is probably Michael Pollan, who writes about cooking and food. Oh, um, <laughs> my dad was a cook, so uh, if any of you have ever read *The Botany of Desire*, that is one of the most beautifully written books about 
tomato, what, corn, you know, hoop, and marijuana. I mean, he writes, he, he writes a book about, about four plants, and it's like, how do you do this and make it so not only delicious, but educational and intriguing. So, um, P-O-L-L-A-N. Um, and the other, okay, Lily King. I loved her latest book, Euphoria. That was incredible. That was a beautiful book. I, I should also mention, if you want the music, the music is available um, on Amazon Digital Music Downloads. Um, all you have to do is do a search for Playing With Fire and, and the name of the tune, Enchantio, which is in the books. Uh, and it'll pop up. Suzanne Howe um, performs it. Um, and you get, if you, if you download the music from Amazon or from iTunes, you get the bonus in that you get the long version. You just heard the short version. The long version, Suzanne added a, a violin cadenza that, that she composed just for this music. It's a minute of extra violin music. It is extraordinary. I mean, she's just, nobody else can play the violin like she does. With that, I think we're going to have to say.